and I pray that all of us once again uh, when we shall have to appear before the judgments of Christ we will not be found ashamed in Jesus name uh, let's go very quickly to the um, uh, business of the day um, I've been asked to speak on the theme chosen for this conference ministry the past present and the future and our spiritual outlook on impact so I would um, weave the uh, topic uh, I've chosen, which is back to basics, uh, around or into uh, the chosen theme. Ministry, the past, present, and the future. Back to basics. Uh, let's read from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I read from verse 11. Ephesians 4 from verse 11. And he himself gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Um, when we talk about the ministry, we have to come back to the Bible, uh, which remains our anchorage. You know that a ship at sea that refuses to return to the anchorage from time to time will just be drifting. Uh, of uh, uh, shore and the Bible is all we need for faith and experience because at the end of the day we shall have to return to the same Bible which is our anchorage and um, if we say we have to return to the basics of the ministry uh, we are saying we should return to the Bible and what exactly does, it, does the Bible say about the ministry um, what does the ministry entail you know, we have the words of men and philosophies and wisdom of men and women with us all the time. But the word of God is a standard. So it doesn't matter how I, as a preacher, interpret or misinterpret the scripture. The Bible says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. When the Bible says it, it settles it all. And when the Bible says it, uh, there is no room for my own opinion uh, at all. Uh, what does the ministry entail? If you listen to the man of God, um, Martin Luther, the great reformer in church history, he said, and I quote, said, have I not succeeded in wresting from the Pope, the monks, and the priests with my mouth alone, without striking any blow, than have all the emperors with their army and sword? These were the words of Martin Luther, the great reformer in church history. He said, his success and um, cannot be compared at all uh, with any other one success. He said with his mouth alone, he has succeeded in get taking away from the uh, hands of the Pope, the monks, and the priests without striking a blow, without lifting a finger against anyone. But with my mouth alone, I've succeeded in liberating people from the shackles of religiosity and uh, spiritual uh, oppression. In other words, um, what it meant was that uh, the ministry happens to be the greatest and the highest call that anyone here on earth can receive. The ministry um, is greater and higher than any local, national, or international calling. I know that many of us may want to aspire uh, to some international um, offices, but uh, there is no international calling, there is no national calling, no local calling can compare at all with the call into the uh, ministry. God has only one son and he made him a preacher. So nothing can be better than that. The man of God, um, Minister McKean, who lived and uh, ministered in Scotland, um, he died at the age of 29 and ministered for only seven years. And on his deathbed, he said, I couldn't have spent my life otherwise. And that's it. 
I couldn't have spent my life for that. Though short, seven years of ministry and 28 years in this uh, uh, land of the living. But he said, there is no other way I could have spent my life than preaching uh, the gospel. And when we talk about the ministry, you know, we have to, first of all, clear away the traditional concept of the, of the ministry. Uh, what do we mean by traditional concept? Ask anybody in the street. Ask them what uh, their definition of the ministry is or of a minister. Um, the likely answer they will give you is uh, somebody with a special robe, someone who has had the oil of anointing poured upon his head, uh, someone who wears the clerical collar. Uh, to them, the ministry is limited to the archbishop and uh, all other titles, ecclesiastical council, I mean, titles that we may want to confer uh, on people. But the Bible remains our guide. Um, and that's why I said that we have to return to the basics. And that's what the Bible uh, teaches. You know, um, there are two endowments. Two endowments like the uh, children of um, Jacob. Um, you know that um, Joseph, amongst them, had two endowments. One, uh, he, he, he had the robe of many colors given to him by who? His father, yes. But um, he had another endowment, which was his dream. His dream. Who gave him that? God, of course. Two endowments. One given to him by his father. The other one given to him by God himself. And, um, you know, you know that they took his coat of many colors away from him. Forcibly. They stripped him of that coat of many colors, but nobody could strip him of the gift of dream and its interpretation. One was conferred on him by man, the other one given to him by God himself. And so when it comes to the ministry, you know, we have to um, endeavor to see that we have this endowment of God upon our lives and our ministry. Otherwise, it's nothing. You know, many could be like Naaman. You know, when Naaman came to see the man of God, Elisha, the man of God told him, go and wash in the Jordan. That was the simple instruction. Go wash in that uh, river. But uh, Naaman said, uh, let, me, let me read. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11, it says, but Naaman was angry. He was wroth. He was furious, and he went away. And said, Behold, I thought, I thought, you see, can you deny that? I thought, I thought it would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the, on the name of the Lord and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He was self opinionated, he thought. And today, you know, if no man had remained in his I thought, in his self opinion, he would have died a leper. There are some people today who think they have a ministry, but ministry that is not commissioned by God Himself. They think like David. David wanted to build um, the temple for the Lord. But the Lord said, no, 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 you cannot. No, no, no. Number one, you are under discipline. You have shed too much blood. You cannot build any uh, I mean, um, temple for me. Number one. Number two. Um, uh, yes, number one, you are under discipline. Number two, I want to tell you that your time is up. You are going to die. You are coming home very soon. Number three, I never told you in the first place to build a temple for me. You know, if God had not intervened, David could have gone ahead or would have gone ahead and he was succeeded in built a very gigantic uh, temple and would be named after him David's temple. But God was not into it. God never commissioned it. So there are some people today who think they have a ministry, but a ministry that was never ever commissioned by God. That's why uh, as Christians and as ministers, there are two basic questions we all have to ask God. You know, and these are the two questions Paul the Apostle asked the Lord Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus. Number one, when he fell under the power of God, he said, who are you, Lord? Number one thing, we, we need to ask this question of him. Who are you, Lord? When I say who are you, it means I want to know you. Our knowledge of him is basic. 
is one of the basics we have to return to. Our knowledge, we have, we have to know the Lord personally. Number two question, um, Paul asked that day on his way to Damascus was, what will you have me to do, Lord? Not what I want to do, not what others want me to do, not what the church wants me to do, but what do you want me to do? Those two questions are very much basic as far as our relationship with Christ is concerned. We need to, yes, we know him personally, and then we need to know what exactly he wants us to do. Otherwise, one may just be gallivanting around the world, running from pillar to post, uh, thinking. Some people can be busy doing nothing for the Lord, but in their own eyes, they are, they are doing something for the Lord. But something they are doing that is not commissioned uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, himself. You know, and we have the Bible, which is very much replete with examples of such men. Men, women who are not saints, but they run. They run, they, they, they do some things, they make efforts, but they just run without being, uh, being sent. In the days of Jeremiah, we have scriptures that tell us that I have not sent these prophets, yet they run. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. And uh, we have so many uh, of these uh, uh, texts to confirm what we are talking about here. You know, remember Saul? Saul was anointed and David was also anointed. But there's a difference between the anointings of the two. Saul was anointed, if you remember, from, uh, with oil. The oil fr was from a flask. You remember? Fl from a flask. Okay? But, you know, flask is man-made. God doesn't make flasks. This is a man-made vessel. It is from the oil in that flask, from that oil, that uh, um, Saul was anointed. But we have another anointing, the anointing of uh, David. The Bible says, God said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesus the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. You know, one was anointed with oil from the flask, which was made by man. Another one was anointed with oil made or put in horn. Man can't make horn. It's only God. So we need to, we, you see, when we are, we say we are in, in, into the ministry, we need to ask ourselves the questions. My anointing comes from where? You see, it's from uh, that which was made by man or by God himself. And you know, there is a difference between the dew of heaven and uh, body sweat. They both make you uh, look wet. Okay? When the dews come upon you, you are wet. But when you are sweating, you are also wet. But there's a difference. So people may be struggling doing this or that, but that cannot compare with the very dew of heaven. That's why if there's anything we need more today, it is this dew of heaven upon us and uh, our ministries. And so when Samuel got to the house of uh, Jesse, you know, do you have some children here, some sons? Yes, the Lord has said he's going to appoint one of them as the king of Israel. And the first one that came out was Eliab. That's a big name. That sounds like that of the king, Eliab. Sounds like that of a prophet, Eliab. But God said, no, that's not the one. And the other one came, the second one, Abinadab. So that sounds very academic. Uh, <laughs> Abinadab. So you have some jaw-breaking uh, uh, names. And, uh, but God said, no, not this one. Then the other one, the third one came out. His name was Shama. Shama. That sounds like that of a judge. But God said, no. Until they sent for the very man of God's own sending. And that's David uh, himself. A semi-reject, a non-entity was chosen. We have the example of Gideon. Gideon, a failed farmer. A failed farmer. And uh, who had never had any military uh, training, and then yet it was the one God sent to go and bring deliverance to the people of God, uh, Israel. And the call of God to the ministry is not about um, fame, it's not about popularity. So the Bible says the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So it's not about that money, not about that fame, not about that popularity, not about that jeep, not about that property. Yes, God does do all this. 
uh, as he wills, as he likes. I remember listening to the man of God, Pastor uh, W.F. Kumeyi, way back in 1988 at uh, um, Vining Church here in Ikeja, the Anglican Church, when we had this seminar on church growth. He made a statement that I've never, never forgotten. He said, when God lays his hands upon a man or a woman, money and material are no problem. But that's not our goal uh, in the ministry when we come to the ministry. You know, you see, when the uh, servants who were uh, assigned some responsibility of bringing the um, report and the, uh, 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 the reward or, or the fruit of their labor to the master, the owner of the vineyard, the Bible says he sent some messengers to them. They maltreated them. But when they saw the son coming, they said, this is the son coming. Let us kill him so that his inheritance will be ours. That's the reason why some people are in the ministry. So that the inheritance of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will, will be theirs. That's all they know about the ministry. But the ministry is not about that. It's not about eating or drinking. It's not about popularity. It's not about fame. It's not about the honor people are called us. And um, we have the example of um, um, a man like uh, Paul who became blind for three days. When he met with the Lord on his way to Damascus, blind. He was, he was led on the road to Damascus, blind. So the Lord did not open his eyes. So that you would not be tempted to think that uh, the Lord who is calling me, is calling me to this uh, uh, affluence, is calling me to this uh, property, is calling me to this car, is calling me to this inheritance, blind. And that's what, how we have to take the ministry, blind. You see, you don't know what God is going to do. It's up to him to do whatever he likes uh, uh, with us. And um, I just pray that the Lord will open our eyes of understanding so that we'll be able to know the difference uh, between this and that. All these um, uh, razzmatazz and everything that is very much uh, prevalent today in the ministry. And that is the reason why some people want to come to the ministry today. But that should not uh, be. You know, that's why, you know, um, the Lord Jesus Christ said some people will receive their reward here on earth. In the end, some people may hear the voice of the master saying, I paid you, I rewarded you with that car when you are in the ministry. I rewarded you with that house. I rewarded you with that money. I rewarded you with this or that. Look at uh, the days of Noah. Noah preached, he ministered, and when he was building the ark, you know, he hired some hands. Some contractors came, some artisans came, some um, this or that came to work on the ark. But you know what? Some of them got paid. They got money. Some of them, from the money given to them, as a result of the work they did on the ark, uh, some of them probably sent their children to school, paid their fees. Some of them bought a, some cars. Some of them built some houses. But... If, uh, if it were this day, some of them would have sent their children abroad from the money realized uh, from that, working on the ark. But you know what? They got money. They got rewarded for working on the ark or in the ark. But the problem is that they had no place in the ark. I pray that that should not be a portion in the name of Jesus. So the ministry... Uh, the greatness of, greatness of it does not consist in that, in that honor, in that respect that people may give to us. One minister said, the ministry is not an easy calling, and I do not envy the man or the woman who takes it uh, easy. The ministry is not about just preaching fine sermons. Yeah. You know, give the microphone to anybody today. They've got something to say. But the ministry is not just about preaching fine sermons, uh, but it's about fighting the host of hell. The Satan and his cohorts, Satan and his demons, who are bent on securing the overthrow of the church. It's, it's, a, it's a battle uh, between truth and untruth, righteousness, unrighteousness, sin and holiness. That's what the ministry uh, is about. And you know, nobody does it. You can't do it by your power, you can't do it alone. That's why we need to be closely related. And we have to follow the, the master very closely. Or it, we follow in his footsteps. Otherwise, one may veer to the left or to the right. But if you follow the master very quickly, or very, very uh, uh, closely, rather, uh, we, we, we have no problem at all. Now, that's why we have to ask the question as a minister. How am I related to Christ? Number one, Christ must be the minister's maker. He makes us. 
a minister is not made in America. A minister is not made in, in England. A minister is not made in the Bible school. A minister is not made by ordination. A minister is not made because of the robe that he wears. Not at all. And that we should know that the church cannot make a minister. That's why Jesus said the um, uh, harvest is truly plen plenteous. Plenteous. But the laborers are few. But the fact that the laborers are few does not give you the license to just send anybody into the field. What can we do? He said, but pray ye therefore to the Lord of harvest to send eh, laborers. The fact that uh, we have a dearth of minister does not give me the license to just send anybody there. It must be, as I said earlier, a man or a woman of God's own sending. If he's sent by God, then the work uh, shall be done according to uh, the standard of the, of the Bible. So when you read all the um, epistles of Paul from the book of Romans to uh, Thessalonica to Timothy and Titus, you will see in the introduction, you will say, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle, not by man nor by man, but by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we all need this endorsement of, the, of, the, of, of our maker. He makes us uh, indeed. So Christ must be the minister's maker. He makes us. So one will be able to, when you look back, when you're the ministry, and you beat your chest in the, in the face of any trouble, in the face of any challenge, you know that he made me. I'm not made by man. I'm not, you know, we have people today who are not, they were not ordained by anybody. And you cannot rubbish their ministry. Why? Because God made them. Ordination is just to recognize. But okay, we know that the spirit of God is upon you. You are talented. You have this gift or that. Then we recognize that gift in you. And therefore, we set you apart. Uh, for the ministry. Then, uh, in the ministry, Christ must be our master. He's the master. Um, you know, there is no minister. No minister should put himself or herself uh, in a place where he is subject to no one. Yes, we know that um, every Christian should be under someone. So, every, every minister must be under someone. Even if you are the general overseer of your church, all your ministry. You still have to be under somebody. You look onto some people for guidance. Sometimes those who will be able to say, no, you are wrong. No, you can't do this. I know of people like that. I'm not going to make, make mention today, but I know of people like that who are general overseer, including the man of God here. Who, they still look onto some people, some fathers, for guidance on, on, on a number of occasions. So, but uh, having said all that, we know that uh, we know the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will never take us to a place where we are subject to no one and where we are outside discipline. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that kind of thing. But having said that, we should know that the Lord Jesus Christ is our master. Yes, we have some uh, leaders to um, obey, uh, to listen to, but the overall master of every minister is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Number three is our means. Christ is the minister's means. Um, let's ask the question, where does the minister get his money from? The question is on the altar. They live by the altar, they eat there on the altar. You know, the minister is supported by the head of the church himself. That's why the Bible says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such, such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? It's our means. He provides for his own. You know, and um, that's one secret, one, one secret in the ministry. Yes, you are paid. You have your check every month or so. But when you look at uh, your uh, uh, expenses, uh, you have to take care of this, take care of that. You would see that the pay packet the paycheck given to us at the end of every week or month is nothing uh, to take care of the minister indeed. Is our means. And so we can, we can, I know that many of us, we, we're under pressure sometimes, family pressure, some financial pressure. We have to send children to school. We have to do this or that. And that's the reason why some people misbehave in the ministry. They misbehave. You know, uh, 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 without dragging the name of the Lord in the mud. 
without without being uh, 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 schematic without manipulating anyone the lord keeps providing for the needs of his uh, own uh, people so we can say yes the lord is my helper we can boldly say that what can man do uh, to me yes we have every right when you have sown a seed somewhere or some seed somewhere you have every right to go to the place you have sown your seed and look forward to the harvest but sometimes it doesn't work like that in the ministry you may sow some seed here in lagos and the lord uh, may, may, may repay you in meduguri that's how it works and uh but sometimes we we, we like to uh, uh, fix our eyes on the harvest whereas it should not be that way but rather fixing our eyes on the lord of harvest himself you bless some people they don't see you anymore they don't think of you anymore you have done your work for the lord jesus christ the bible says cast your bread upon waters and you're going to see it uh after uh some long time so then christ is um the minister's mentor when we're in the ministry we have a mentor you know um paul said for i never received it from man nor was i taught it but it came through the revelation of jesus christ so christ our lord will lead us to men will lead us to books will lead us to tapes will lead us to bible college will lead us to seminary whereby we can learn we learn from men from women we learn from tapes from the other people's uh, uh, ministry administration and so on and so forth but yes but the overall mentor the teacher the trainer of the minister in the ministry is the lord jesus christ uh, himself so therefore we have to see things by ourselves see things yourself beware of secondhand theology see things yourself and that's why paul has the question who are you lord i want to know you we need to know the lord personally we need to see things personally and um when you see uh when we have seen the lord the bible says those who know their god all right shall eh? they will be great they will do great exploits so knowing him personally is one key uh, in the ministry and then christ is our model our model jesus christ remains our model all right we must discover how he preached how he taught how he prayed how he reacted to situations and we must do likewise because he's our model never ever you fashion your ministry after any minister the, we, we are all mortars and we are all fallibles but if you fashion your ministry after the greatest model our Lord Jesus Christ himself there will be no problem uh, at all and that Christ is our message in the ministry we preach nothing but Christ okay Jesus only is our message and that's the reason when Christ is your message you don't attach people to yourselves but you attach them to Christ we must beware of, uh, be careful that we don't turn church members into a fans club of sorts fans club fans is an abbreviation for fanatics you know that uh, when you uh, you're a supporter of uh, Manchester United or Arsenal or whatever whatever they do what do you do you clap for them anyway because you are a fanatical member a fans club you are you are you 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 are a fanatic of that uh, 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 football club or whatever so if care is not taken in the ministry we can turn people into kind of a fanatic club of fanatics so that they just clap for us anything we do i mean it's okay no problem at all but we should attack when you attach people to christ john the baptist when he preached at jordan the Bible says when the Lord Jesus christ appeared he showed christ to them and he said this is the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and from that moment the bible says two of his children they began to follow jesus christ we should be ready to lose our members to christ and not to attach them to us these are some of the uh, keys and secrets of successful ministry uh, indeed and what's the purpose of our calling yes the bible says to perfect the saints it is not it is not the church perfecting the minister it is the minister perfecting the church. Uh, it, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that, that the church will perfect the minister. We are given to the church to perfect the sin. How do we do that? Number one, we do that doctrinally. It should grieve us, grieve us very deeply when we see spiritual ignorance 
amongst the people to whom we minister. Some people are very ignorant. They don't know their right from their left when it comes to some fundamental teachings and doctrines of the Bible. And um, we teach them by experience. We, 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 we bring them up. We build them up. Okay? We perfect them by experience. There are church members who do not know the difference between um, I, I said it earlier, between the dew and the sweat. Between a river and an erosion. Between um, the wheat and the tears. They are so gullible, they clap for just anything. They clap for anybody. But when we teach them doctrinally and we teach them experientially, they will know. The Bible says those people, uh, when we have trained them like that, they will know the difference between the good and the bad. They don't follow just anybody. They don't clap for just any ministry because they know what the difference uh, is. And then we perfect them in righteousness. We should cause our people to know what sin is. Sin in all its facets. Let people know uh, what sin uh, is. And uh, today, we thank God for all we see all over the world, especially in our country, Nigeria. You see, if today um, the meeting of general overseers is to be uh, called, you will see that thousands will attend. So, we know that ours is the most religiously saturated period in the history of our nation. There are churches everywhere. Ministries are, are springing up every day. Bible schools here and there. Uh, crowd pulling ministries being uh, pastor by dynamic communicators. We all have them with us here today. Ordination of pastors is always ongoing. We have so much of psychosocial teaching all, all over the place today. The church is becoming very dynamic when it comes to dishing out psychosocial teachings. But then, the sale of the Bible is all more than ever. And, uh, but with what results? What's the impact of all this on the people? For example, it has been noted that Christianity in Nigeria is mile wide and inch deep. And that's, that calls for a kind of um, um, thought. We have to think about that. We have to ruminate over that. Over that. That's, what, that's the judgment of some people about Christianity in Nigeria. Mile wide, inch deep. What impact are we making? We may have affluence and not influence. And that, that's why I would say we have to go back to the basics of what the Bible teaches. And um, we look at all we have. We thank God for them. Thank God for Rehoboth. Thank God for, for enlightenment. Thank God for everything that we are seeing today in the Nigerian church. But yeah, if you take a very closer look at some of the things happening in churches today in this country, you want to believe or you want to agree with me that something is basically wrong with modern Christianity. And that which is wrong with us is not financial. And that can be shown in our annual balance sheet every year when we tell the world how much the Lord has blessed us with. So our annual balance sheet shows that, yes, we are okay. But we still want to say that the church is not a bank. It's not a bank. That which is wrong with us is not administrative. There are churches that have built uh, a very... Uh, a, a, big pyramid of authority when it comes to um, administration. Administration that you, can, you cannot fault. But yet, that is not everything about the church. That which is wrong with us sometimes may not be about infrastructure. Why we thank God for everything we are seeing here today and everywhere in the world. Yet, something is still wrong with us as a church of God in Nigeria. You know, we need to ask the question, what is the secret of the early church? What did they do right that we are not doing today? Why were they able to uh, withhold and withstand all the fierce persecution of their days? What, 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 why, why, why were they what they were? And why are we what we are today? You know, understanding our past is very much important. And therefore, we have to go to certain um, basics. Number one, some things are basic. We are called to preach. To re bring people to repentance. Repentance remains the entrance through which people come into the, into the kingdom of God. When John the Baptist came here, he preached it. Repent, repent, repent. When our Lord Jesus Christ came to his public ministry, he, he, he did it. Repent, repent, they repent. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up 
and uh, 3,000 became converted under an unprepared sermon. What he said was that, repent therefore and believe the gospel. So we cannot do away with that. The basic of repentance. Let's tell the world. Let the people who hear us uh, repent. You know, repentance today is um, like it's not, uh, uh, we, we no longer um, appreciate that today in the church. We have to preach some things. We have to go back to the basic of uh, the power of God. That people today, the ministry, they are looking for power here and there, power here and there, power here and there. But uh, it is not the power of God. There are many things that have been done today in the name of the Lord and not by the Lord Himself. We have to go back to the basic of uh, the apostolic doctrine. We have so many doctrines today that are either biblically wrong or biblically uh, suspense or suspects. So we need to go back to all this. We need to go back to the uh, uh, basic of uh, uh, talking about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we do this, it will have been said of us that we have fulfilled our ministry. That's why when uh, Paul was writing, he said, when you see Archippus, tell him to take care of the ministry committed unto him and fulfill it. Don't argue with him. Don't tell him another thing. Just tell him, fulfill your ministry. That is, fill it to the full. I pray that in this onerous task of the ministry, we will not fail the Lord. I pray that when we have to appear before his judgment seat, we will not receive his condemnation, but his commendation. God bless you all. I'm sorry, Lord, for the standing of Jesus. Oh, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to do better than that. Before we do that, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. We can't uh, see this fountain of knowledge and not dream from this world. We will see it. And so we're going to do that. So if you have any question, you can write it. If you want to come also uh, to the microphone, we'll give you the opportunity to, to ask the questions. Um, I believe we'll be able to take like four. And so if you want to ask, come quick. Not when somebody asks and then you want to do a follow-up question. Any question, very good. Please straight to the point, your name and what the question is. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is David Atonda. I want to thank God for our speaker. I've really gained a lot. But there's an aspect of pastor's manipulation which I want more clarification. Uh, most times when you visit servants of God, like the one I had yesterday, a brethren are passing through challenges. And by the time you get to the man of God, he said, can you drop $5,000? So that we can pray for you. Like maybe prayer, shame, and what have you. And those things are not found in those days where you emphasize. So what can we do? Must a pastor request for such reward before he can do due diligence to the issue of brethren? Thanks so much. Um, I used to have uh, a teacher in one of the Bible schools I attended uh, overseas. If you ask uh, him this kind of question, you say, what should we do? He will tell you, get a gun, shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, this is the reason we have to understand our Bible. We don't have to be gullible. You know, we don't have so many Bereans today, Berean Christians. When Paul was writing about the Bereans, he compared them with the Thessalonian believers. He said, the Thessalonians, they thought they were doing Paul a great deal of honor by not asking him questions. Well, whatever Paul said, they would take who climb and sinker. Somebody has asked the, uh, added one thing to that. He said, who climb, sinker, and fisherman. But the Bereans, to the Thessalonians, 
It is our father speaking. Our father. Therefore, we have not, we do not have to question anything. But to the Berean Christians, when Paul had taught them, they will not sit down, compare the word of Paul with the word of God. And though you cannot in any way manipulate people like that. And when Paul was writing, he described the Berean Christians as the spiritual eugenies in Greek, well born, the, the spiritual aristocrats. He said they are, they, are, they are more commendable than the Thessalonian uh, believers. The answer is, let us know our Bible. I've said it, we have Christ as our model. Did he teach that? This is somebody, when he was here physically ministering, he will heal, he will deliver, he will perform miracle, and uh, he will still tell people, tell no, no one, and go and pay your vow, and whatever offering, to who? The priest. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's it. The Lord will bless his minister. I've said it, when you sow a seed, you don't expect anything back. The Lord knows how to reward you. So, but, you know, people will stop doing that kind of thing when we no longer uh, uh, respond positively to their request. That's where I'm standing here. All right. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, sir, Daddy. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Baba, I want to add this question. Uh, I lodged you the hotel there, so I was told you I'm coming this morning. And this question has been put in my mind, so I needed to ask you. In this last election, we have, before the election, we have so, so many of God who are prophesying all manner of prophecy. I want to know because on social media, they are mocking us. And I want to know, I, there was a man from Gupa Shaw Summer. He was say there won't be any election. He yes. said, God said it. Yep. He said, no reverse. Yep. There was election. Yes. I want to know, is it God still speaking to us in this country? Are we, are we, are we still here from God, Baba? Tell us. Well, Thank you. Thank Baba, you. Is, is God a God of confusion? Is it possible for God to tell one election will not hold? Tell okay. another one Tinubu will win? Yeah. Tell another one Obi will win? Well, um, to start with, our God is not a talkative. So he has uh, so many profound things to tell us than all this we are listening to. So, and um, the Bible has, that's why, go back to the Bible. I tell you that the Bible is all we need for faith and experience. Because at the end of the day, we have to go back to the Bible. What we, that's the question. What does the Bible say about that? The Bible says, how do you recognize a true prophet? When a true prophet says, thus says the Lord, and it comes to what? That's, that's one proof that is a man, a woman of God, speaking the mind of God. And that's not the only test. The Bible says, well, if the prediction of such a prophet has come to pass, and tomorrow, he says, because my prophecy the other time has come to pass, therefore, let us go and worship an idol or another god. He said, that's a proof that although his prediction has come to pass, yet no minister of God, no prophet of God will say, let us go and worship another god. We have the tests. How to test? The Bible says, you have to examine all spirits. Or examine them. Prove them. And the Bible says we have an anointing, anointing that is supplied from on high, that tells you if this one is wrong or if it is right. So we know. You know that one thing is that people have no shame. Those who say that, who say that, and it's not coming to pass, tomorrow they will still come out and say, God says the Lord. And uh, amazingly, some people will still follow them. So know your Bible. God bless you. Tell your neighbor, know your Bible. So if you look at your screen right now, if you have questions, there's going to be a link on the screen. You can use the barcode and then you can ask your questions directly. There's an hashtag on the, on the screen, which is hashtag 791084. You can just go to shelhido.com. And then put in that number, you would be able to ask your questions, just like the one you see on the screen. Yeah. All right, so before we take the other one, yeah. that they're asking the storm of false dogma seems to overshadow those teaching the truth. How do we correct this? Yes, 
that's all right. This is not, uh, this shall be strange because the Bible says that in the last days all this shall happen. False doctrine. Doctrines that are, I have said it, either biblically wrong or biblically suspect. And the question remains the same. I said, go back to basics. You know, if you understand your Bible, you know, the Bible tells us in um, one of the books in Old Testament, it said, I'm going to judge between a sheep and a goat. So the, the fact that one is a sheep and one is a goat, I will judge between them. And I'm going to judge between a sheep and a sheep. Why is it that some sheep, when they feed on uh, whatever is given to them, they become robust and some are lean? The same, the same uh, sheep, the, the sheep eating from the same source. So the Lord is going to ask some people, why, you, you, are, you are my sheep? You're a member of the church. Why is it that somebody is becoming robust, becoming, becoming stronger in the faith, and you are just lagging behind everything, and you are getting lean? Uh, 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 it is as of uh, the son of, uh, um, one of the sons of uh, David, um, Amnon. His friend asked him, why is it that you, the prince, is becoming lean every day? God is going to answer, ask, ask that question of us. Why are we becoming lean? Are you not being fed? So, yes. Dogma, false dogma, overshadowing. It can never overshadow it. Because the Bible, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And the word of God uh, settles it all. That's why we keep saying, Understand what the scripture says. I, I like the man of God uh, when he was here on earth, the late Billy Graham. When he preached, he would say, The Bible says. And he would make some statements, The Bible says. That is, that's the final authority. No other word in the midst of the cacophony of the voices we are hearing today. When the Bible says his voice drowns all other voices, the question is answered. And it's the same answer again. Understand your Bible. Okay. My name is Olo Jebenezer, sir. And thanks to God for the gift of you and people like uh, Daddy, Pastor Ezekiah. Okay. Success in ministry over time has been manipulated. Uh, people seem to term material things, modern things, ephemeral things to be success in ministry and it's becoming a problem in our present age. So how do we strike a balance in this, you know, as a, as a minister? That's number one. Then number two is this, sir. How do you leave a place as a minister where your time is up carefully and not have uh, a problem that would bite you or haunt you later All in right. the future? All right. Can, can it, how do you leave a place? So, so the first one, sir, is... Yeah. How do you define success in ministry? Is it the pastor who has money, who has jeeps, who has a big auditorium, who has cars that is successful? How about the guy in the village without all of this? Number two, you're serving under a man of God. I believe that's what he's asking. And you want to leave when your time is up. How do you leave without rancor? Yeah, that's all right. Um, how do we define success? You know, first of all, we don't have to measure uh, success according to scale, the scale of this world. The world has a, uh, its, its own scale. Remember, Pastor Amos told us that, uh, thank God, they still have a uh, um, good, uh, fond memory of the message we preached uh, the last time we ordained some people in this ministry some years back. Rhoda. Rhoda didn't have a light followership. She wasn't a deaconess. She wasn't um, a pastor. She wasn't, uh, but all she did that day was to get up from the room where they were praying and to open the door for Peter. And his na her name remains in the book of life and the Bible till today. So, success, yes. We thank God, uh, but um, not according to how the world measures things and nobody knows what success is until we have laid down our swords at the feet of the master and we hear the voice of the master saying welcome you good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your lord nobody knows what success is until then nobody knows The second question is, how do you leave, you know, someone you report to, maybe yep. your senior pastor, yep. 
you want to leave the ministry because God has told you to leave yep. without creating problems for yourself That's all right. or getting your man of God to curse you. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. Um, he has also answered the question, how do you live without causing rancor? The answer is there. It's probably, the answer is also intertwined with the question. You leave and make sure you don't cause any rancor. It's as simple as that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So and we have we have we have the Holy Spirit. If indeed it is the Holy Spirit that has sent us, even when you are convinced and the leader, the bishop, the general vice is not convinced, give them time, so they too will see the face of the Lord, and then they will hear uh, from Him. And relationship, one of the books of Pastor Amos is relationship is a uh, everything. That is it. It depends on how you've been relating to uh, one another uh, in the past, but. Uh, we, we can do that. The Bible says we are called unto peace. So we can do that without causing any problem at all. And we know what to do. If indeed um, we are being led by the Spirit, okay, the Lord who has convinced you will also convince the leader and he will let go of you without any uh, record of uh, acrimony or animosity. Sir, you've been around for 40 years. What has been your top? three secrets. What has been your staying power in ministry? Thank you so much. Uh, by the grace of God, we came into the ministry after some years of training. It started in 1969, my training, and then came fully into the ministry in 1974, when we graduated from the Bible College. That's some um, 49 years uh, now. And about um, the secret, um, Paul, as told you, said, who are you, Lord, and what would you like me to do? So there, are, there have been times when I wanted to do my own thing, but um, knowing his will, knowing his will. Uh, one of my teachers in England, the late Reverend John Jacks, has been dean. He's been here in Nigeria twice, 1981 and 2012. He's not going to be with the Lord. He told me something. He told us something in the class one day. And he said, to be in the master's will is better than success. And uh, this has a kind of uh, uh, impression upon, upon me and uh, my, my life to today. And I remember graduating from the International Bible Training College in Sussex, in um, Budget City, West Sussex in England, 1979. The song we presented as student choir uh, says, there have been times when giving and loving brought pain, and I've promised I will never let it happen again. But I found out that the loving was well worth the risk, and that even in losing, you win. And the refrain says, I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love. I could never, never out love the Lord. That has been my guiding principle. I want to live the way he wants me to live. Not the way people want to me live, not the way I want to live, but the way he wants me to live. And to be in the master's will is better than so there will be offers. There'll be, there'll be well, well, mouth-watering offers. I've no, uh, people have approached me in the past to come and do this, come and be that. No, is it the will of God for me? To be in the master's will is better than success. Thank you so much, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Daniel Omotayo Akisomi, one of your secret disciples. My question is, uh, sir, why you were younger than this, I know that this thing that you have maintained called basics, you said going back to basics okay. is what you had been preaching till 49 years in ministry. But I understand that when falsehood or lies becomes the father of the ceremony, the truth looks like a rebel. What is the question? Now, the question is, how do you manage people that termed you rebellious in the ministry? Why you started and you were emphasizing on going back to the basics? So... Are right. you, do you know for a fact that he was rebellious? Because that's, that's an assumption that he was rebellious. Tamed. They tamed him to be rebellious. Okay. Baba, were you rebellious, sir? Were you tamed rebellious? No, 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 no. I was, uh, well, call it 
radicalism, but nothing like rebellion. <laughs> nah, because I mean, uh, I remember 26 years ago, I was posted out of circulation, posted from uh, CAC Songo in Ibadan, a church in the metropolitan uh, area, to the remote uh, uh, part of the country, to Efunalaye. And uh, there were cancers then. Some people were asking me not to go. I said, I am a man under authority. authority. So, and um, never rebellious. But uh, if you talk of uh, some, of being radical, of being uncompromising, on bending, on yielding. And I you see, Christianity is a defined religion. That's what thing. It, 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 the way to do it has been defined in the Bible. You cannot redefine really Christianity or the ministry for me. It's all shown and clearly taught in the scripture. So I will obey you uh, in a way but that you know that you know, this boy is uh, uh, he knows what he's doing to the glory of God. Yeah. One final question and I'll merge two questions on Slido into two. There's a question that is CAC Pioneer the 1930 revival. What do you think we, the younger generation, could glean that will enhance our productivity at this time? Maybe merge it with, you know, what doctrines of the apostles is lacking today? Yeah. What the apostles did yeah. that we're not doing anymore? Yeah. And what, what we can learn? Yeah. Um... I was in Singapore in 1989 for a short course, Ega Institute, some of you know about it. And um, I, during the, uh, 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 the time we spent there, I, didn't, I chose not to attend any Pentecostal charismatic church, or rather an Anglican church. I went to Anglican church throughout um, the time we stayed there in Singapore. And about I saw that, um, uh, why attending this Anglican church I, it's like <clears throat> I thought I should pour contempt upon my Pentecostal pride because of what was happening then. You will see an Anglican priest wearing all the cassock and still be prophesying on Sunday, telling you there is somebody with a condition there, come out, laying hands on the sick. And uh, one Reverend Lim who came to teach us and uh, was a Methodist minister, and we asked him, why, why are you doing all this? And um, he told us that uh, John Wesley, it is told in church history that he would pray for the sick, he spoke in tongues, he did this, he did that. And the Methodist church in um, Singapore and other Orthodox churches, they came to the realization that the God of John Wesley has not changed. It is the church that has changed. And therefore, all they did was to go back to basics. And uh, things are now happening. Go to Orthodox churches in Asia. They're on fire for the Lord. You know, yes, we know that modernism and globalism has taken over some things and uh, we're doing things differently. But methods remain. This, uh, methods may, may change, but we have to commit it to principle. Principle. The principle of whatever we do in the church is to gain souls to the kingdom of God. And that, that we cannot do without going back to what the apostles did then. Read the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, everything they did then is to the glory of God and for the edification of souls. We cannot do otherwise. We cannot afford to do otherwise today. So, uh, what did they have that we don't have today? There was only one thing that was going for them then. That is God. God. I'll soon finish. No, uh, Reverend, um, I remember David something, I will remember his name. He, he said he, he was uh, a Chinese man, but not living in the mainland China, but in Hong Kong. But he would go from Hong Kong to China all the time. And he said anytime he got to China, he, he would see testimonies of this pastor saying he baptized 199 people today. Tomorrow, 199. Tomorrow, next week, 199. He said, he asked them the question, why, why, why? He said, because if you baptize up to 200, you need government permit to do that. So there are 
so many people that are converted, but we can't baptize them all at once. And he said to them, what's the secret of all this? He said, this is me coming from uh, um, um, Hong Kong. I'll go, come to China. I will tell them all we did in America, how we had dinner in this uh, five-star hotel, and so on and so forth. He said, this is me talking about five-star hotel to pastors in China who are sitting under the, on the grass under the all-star hotel. You know what that means? Yeah, in the evening. It's all the stars, not just five star now. Under the, the <laughs> you see, and uh, he said when he had told them all this, he said one old Chinese pastor, you could see the marks of persecution upon his face. He said he looked at him one day and he said, "You people, you have much of God, but we have God." If that means anything to us, God, it is God and God and God. All other things will follow and fall in place. But today, we may have all other things and not God. So if there's anything we have to do today, it's going back to him. He will do all the rest that we are looking after, that we are endeavoring to have. Let's go back to him. He's the source of all things. All power belongs uh, to him. And when we have preached the gospel, he will back it up. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So I hope the person who asked the question, why are we not seeing the fire like in the days of Apostle Babalola? In Yoruba they say, and I think in CAC, Oluwambe, Bita, Tijo.